Welcome to the library this evening. My name is Renee, and I'd also like to welcome those who are watching via live stream. If you would please just take note of the evaluation forms that are in your chairs or at the back of the room. And if you would please just provide some feedback about our program this, this evening. We like hearing that feedback from you. Uh, our presenter this evening, we'll go ahead and get started. Our presenter this evening is Eric Fusillet. Eric is an environmental project manager at Craft and Tull, where he works with civil engineers and landscape architects to select native plant species for the rain gardens, bioswales, detention ponds, and commercial development projects they design. Eric is the president of the Arkansas Native Plant Society and serves on the Missouri Prairie Foundation's Grow Native Committee. He also serves on the National Board for Wild Ones, Native Plants, Natural Landscapes, which is a volunteer organization dedicated to promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity. And he is the president of Wild Ones Ozark Chapter. At this time, I'm gonna turn things over to Eric. As our presenter, he's gonna be allowed to take his mask off, so that's okay, <laughs> permission to do that. Um, and he'll also be answering some questions at the end of his presentation. I thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Renee. Thank you all for being here today to talk about a couple of topics that are near and dear to my heart, native plants and how we can use native plants to improve environmental quality. How can we use native plants to improve stormwater quality, air quality? Um, that's what we'll be going in today. Um, but like Renee mentioned, um, I'm involved with a couple, few different organizations in the area, the Arkansas Native Plant Society and Wild Ones uh, being two of those. And I really want to invite you to go uh, to those websites. Uh, Arkansas Native Plant Society's website is ANPS.org. And Wild Ones, our local chapter's website is Ozark.WildOnes.org. And on that site, you'll find a um, list of many of the species I'm going to talk about here today um, and how they can be used to remediate certain contaminants. So without further ado, let's get started here. Just a brief background, um, or a brief outline of my talk. I'm gonna kind of give some, a little bit of background information on phytoremediation, just so everybody has, you know, a common set of understandings that uh, we're working with here. I'm gonna talk about use, uh, the benefits of using native species for phytoremediation and phytotechnology, and then different applications for these. I also want to say, just before we get started, that this is the very first in-person talk that I've, the last one was February 29th in this very same room, 2020. Um, and so, you know, I've been doing virtual programs since then, so just bear with me if I'm a little rusty on how to do these live in-person events. So it's a little different. All right, but a little bit of background. First, I'm to start off a little more broad than phytoremediation, talk about phytotechnology. What is phytotechnology? Well, these are plant-based methods for remediating or containing environmental contaminants in soil, sediment, groundwater, or surface water. And so within that larger umbrella, and this can apply to more than just remediating um, contaminants. I mean, it can apply to erosion control, you know, catching sediment, stormwater, riparian areas, all sorts of things, uh, stream bank stabilization. But within that larger umbrella, we have a smaller set uh, of ideas, and this is uh, phytoremediation. And there's different ways that you can use biological processes to remediate environmental contaminants. Uh, there's a whole other field called mycoremediation, and that's looking at how to use fungus uh, for uh, different fungal species for remediating environmental contaminants. But we're going to really stick to plants because that's uh, the one I know a little more about. I'm not really as well versed in uh, the fungi. But phytoremediation refers to plant-based approaches to environmental remediation or improving the environment or taking parts of the environment that are contaminated and either breaking down or detoxifying those various contaminants in the environment. So things to consider when you're trying to decide what species are gonna be used uh, or what, what species are gonna work well for a project like this is you wanna choose a species uh, that's able to uh, tolerate the contaminants that are found on site. Um, also, I mean, species that are going to be aggressive and can outcompete undesirable plant species are going to be preferred if it's a type of project where, or a site that's not going to be uh, on a regular basis. Now, I want you to also consider that uh, if you're wanting to apply these concepts to like a, a rain garden in town, commercial um, 
development project like a you know, parking lot, that sort of thing, you probably want to choose some less aggressive species, and we'll go over some of those too. And at this point, I refer you to also to the ozark.wildones.org website because we have a great list on there that was put together by Lisa Morrison, a uh, local native plant expert, on some of the more what she calls well-behaved native species. Yes, ma'am. The website, ozark.wildones.org. Yep. If you go to what is it, native plants and cultivation tab on that site, you'll see her list at towards the top, and then you'll see it towards the bottom of that page my phytoremediation list. So, so you can kind of cross compare, make sure that you're going to choose a species that's not going to end up just becoming way too weedy. But we do want to make sure that these species that we use are able to handle a little bit or mild, low to moderate levels of this contamination, which is kind of what you would find typically in stormwater runoff. We also want to consider the root structure and depth of the species that we're selecting for these projects. Um, you know, the plant has to be able to reach the contaminant. And then just uh, as far as the root structure goes, we need to select species with fibrous root zones when that contamination is within five feet of the surface. And the reason for that is what we call that area around the roots, the, the, call that the rhizosphere. And so within the rhizosphere, um, there are a lot of different microorganisms that are stimulated by the presence of that root and the exudates that that root puts out, whether it be sugars, um, all kinds of other stuff that stimulates microbial activity. And a lot of times these microorganisms are going to be able to break down certain contaminants. We'll get more into that here in a little bit. But when we have plants with a, a very fibrous root system as opposed to plants that have thicker uh, roots, uh, then more of the volume of that soil underneath that plant is going to be taken up by the rhizosphere because um, they have greater surface area. So it's going to really facilitate uh, much more efficient breakdown of contaminants contained in the soil or which may be deposited there by stormwater. All right, so one other kind of uh, I want to make here is that phytoremediation is really best suited for low to moderate levels of contamination. When contamination levels get too high, they're going to usually affect the plant's ability to grow there. So. For a lot of sites that are heavily contaminated, um, sometimes they really just have to look at other methods to uh, remediate those contaminants. So let's talk about, uh, go start this diagram here and talk about some different types of uh, processes that are used in phytoremediation. We'll start at the top and kind of work our way down. So at the top of this diagram, we have phytovolatilization. Well, what is phytovolatilization? Well, this refers to the absorption of a contaminant by a plant from the soil through its roots, followed by the release of that contaminant or a model to the atmosphere through transpiration. So this makes use of uh, the plant's process. You know, a lot of plants are like straws. They're sucking up water from the ground. They transpire, uh, respire water through their leaves. And sometimes as these contaminants uh, come up through them, there, there are certain physiological processes, metabolic processes that are going on in the plant. Uh, and they can modify those contaminants or take them where they would have been initially concentrated in the soil and more toxic in that concentration when they're released into the atmosphere. Um, that concentration is much more diluted and it kind of renders their environmental risk negligible. So things to consider when we're trying to use this process are the evapotranspiration rate of the species. Species that move more water from the soil to the atmosphere are going to be better suited to capture contaminants mobilized in the water, such as stormwater or groundwater. So one thing to consider with these species that have a high evapotranspiration rate, they're typically not going to be drought tolerant. So depending on where you have these things planted, you may have to irrigate them. Uh, but you can install them in large quantities to prevent contaminants from migrating in groundwater plumes. So that's one thing they've looked at uh, with groundwater is having poplars and willows that have this high evapotranspiration rate can actually be used. Uh, and this is a products, process we'll get to at the bottom of this diagram called phytohydraulics to kind of change the direction of groundwater flow or prevent it from uh, migrating too far. But next, let's get down to phytodegradation. What is phytodegradation? This refers to the breakdown of contaminants that are taken up by the plant through the plant's metabolic processes or the breakdown of contaminants external to the plant through the effects of compounds such as enzymes that are produced by that plant. 
So it's very similar to what I talked to talked about earlier, where the microorganisms are breaking down the uh, contaminant. But this refers to um, the plant itself breaking down the contaminants. Uh, the pollutants are degraded and incorporated into plant tissue and used by the plants as nutrients. So when we're trying to employ this type of technique, uh, we want to choose species that have a high biomass. So fast growing species that are going to take up, store a lot more contaminants uh, during the growing season than a species that you know, doesn't produce very much biomass. Also nitrogen fixing pioneer species are currently being studied due to their fast grow rate, growth rate. Uh, high So phyto extraction, what does this refer to? Well, this is the absorption and uptake by plants of large amounts of heavy metals and other contaminants from the soil and their translocation into the above ground parts of the plant. Now, um, this is gonna be more applicable to inorganic contaminants like heavy metals. You know, previously we were talking about degrading contaminants. Those are gonna be for the organic contaminants where you have more than one element put together into a, a molecule, right? Uh, but when it comes to like zinc, aluminum, lead, you know, you can't break these down any further. So how can we get them out of the soil? We can extract them and have that, your plant species that are, um, I'll skip that one, uh, called hyperaccumulators. Uh, these are plant species that are known to take up large amounts of certain heavy metals. Uh, so you want to select hyperaccumulator species if you're trying to remediate uh, heavy metal contaminated soil. Uh, there are other species that are just accumulators. They still accumulate heavy metals, but maybe not at the levels that hyperaccumulators do. And we can still use these if those produce high biomass. They can still be just as useful. Now, the thing about this technique is you do have to harvest the plant from the site in order to get the benefits of that. Otherwise, as the plant, you know, at the end of the growing season, the herbaceous parts uh, will die, go back to the ground, uh, and then redeposit those heavy metals right back on top of the soil where they might become more mobile more easily. But if we harvest those plants, especially the herbaceous ones, and then either incinerate or compost them um, to extract the metals um, or carefully dispose of them, uh, that would help take the metals from the site. Um, and I'll go into some specific species for specific heavy metals here in a little while. Uh, but a point uh, I want to make real quick is um, phytomining is an area that people are starting to look at, and that's a way of reclaiming uh, metals from metal contaminated sites through plants, like mining metals from soil and then uh, processing the plants after harvested to reclaim those metals for reuse. I haven't been able to find any research done on native species uh, with phytomining, but uh, there is some research being done out there, especially with the brassica family. All right, phytostabilization. This is the use of plant species to immobilize contaminants in the soil and groundwater through various methods. It can be done through the absorption and accumulation uh, by those plants' roots, the adsorption onto the surface of the root, or precipitation within the root zone. This does not remove the contaminants from the site. Uh, but effectively immobilizes or stabilizes them, uh, makes them unavailable for entry into the food chain, unless something you have an issue like for herbivory, where an animal might be eating that plant after they've taken up those um, contaminants. Uh, but if the contamination level is high enough at a site, uh, then they'll often put a fence around that to prevent deer and other wildlife from getting in there and eating those plants. Uh, I would like to see more research done on uh, pollinators and insects because those are much more difficult to keep out of a site. I know heavy metals, they've done research on, you know, honeybees bringing heavy metals from pollen back to their hives. Uh, but, you know, I'd be interested in seeing uh, research done on you know, other pollinators and contaminants may enter the food chain because uh, birds eat caterpillars and other insects, um, you know, so keeping the insects out would be a challenge. So phytostimulation, this is similar to phytodegradation. Uh, and this is where the, the contaminants are broken down in the soil through the microbial activity that's enhanced by the presence of the plant roots. I mentioned that uh, plant roots exude all kinds of substances, uh, such as sugars, alcohols, uh, and acids that contain organic carbon. This provides food for the soil microorganisms and enhances their activity. 
uh, microorganisms such as yeast, fungi, bacteria can utilize certain substances as food. You think about hydrocarbons. This is especially effective with petroleum and hydrocarbons. Um, they're carbon-based molecules, and uh, for certain species of microorganisms, they can be used as food. So it's win-win for those. Uh, the loosening of the soil by the plant roots and water availability in the rhizosphere, which is the root zone, uh, also aids the phytostimulation process. However, this is a slower process than phytodegradation. Uh, another uh, point to make on this one is um, it can still occur during the winter time, whereas a lot of the other ones, when the plant goes dormant in the winter time, it's not going to be able to do this. But that soil, especially on the warmer days, we live far enough south that we have some warmer days in the winter time, and there's still some soil microbial activity happening, uh, although at a very reduced rate. Um, so this is one that can still occur when the plants are dormant. And finally, phytohydraulics. This is when we're using plants, especially those with a high evapotranspiration rate, to change the speed or direction of groundwater flow, or even to modify groundwater levels. And this can be combined with phytodegradation and phytovolatilization. Uh, to help pull contaminants out, release them to the atmosphere where they'll be less toxic, or to degrade them through the plant's metabolic processes uh, and to render them or turn them into forms that are less uh, harmful to the environment. Um, again, you know, the species with high evapotranspiration rate typically aren't going to be drought tolerant, uh, but we can, so irrigation may be needed. Um, so, but we can install these also in large enough quantities to prevent uh, groundwater contaminants uh, from, or contaminated groundwater from migrating. All right, so what are the benefits of using native species for phytoremediation? There's been a lot of research on all kinds of species, and some of them are native, some of them are not, and not all species that have been used in phytoremediation projects have been native. I mean, there's been some places that have used horribly invasive aquatic species to remediate uh, municipal wastewater. And they have to really you know, take a lot of extra measures to make sure that these aquatic invasive species don't get out into the environment. Well, native species are already a part of the local web of life. They've been evolving here, uh, evolving in the region in which they're living uh, for thousands, if not millions of years. Um, and so they've been evolving alongside a lot of the same Insects, wildlife, whatnot, that have come to depend on these species in order to complete their life cycles. So like the monarch butterfly depends on milkweed species to complete its annual migration from the mountains of Mexico up to northern United States. And right now they're kind of passing back through Arkansas on their way back to Mexico. Uh, bobwhite quail depend on native plant species for the insects and larvae and grubs to feed their young so that they can have their coveys for the next year. Uh, most bird species rely or a lot on, especially songbird species, a lot on um, caterpillars to feed their young. Um, so, I mean, without native plants that are, you know, supporting butterfly moth populations, there are no those caterpillars. Uh, po caterpillar populations are reduced, and we see a reduction in bird species. So, when we use native species, not only are we remediating the site and the contaminants there, but we can also be taking part in ecological restoration. Now, with the caveat that when the contaminant, depending on the contaminant, depending on the method that we're remediating it, and depending on um, the level of toxicity um, that that contaminant's at at that site, uh, there may be a risk in that contaminant entering the food chain. So that is something you need if you're working on these larger scale phytoremediation projects. If you're working on something as small as a rain garden that's remediating stormwater runoff, you're likely to be safe. Uh, the contaminants aren't on large enough level to be you know, a huge concern there. Uh, and the point I really like to make is a lot of these concepts can still be applied on small local scale for master gardener projects, home landscaping, whatnot. But when you use native species, since they've already evolved here, they're, used, they're already adapted to the local levels of precipitation that we have here. Uh, so we don't have to water them as much. As long as we plant them in a location that they uh, appreciate, uh, and you don't want to plant like a, if you take like a cattail and try to plant it in an upland area, of course, you're going to have to irrigate that. 
Uh, but, you know, if we plant them on the landscape in the areas that they grow well in, they require a lot less input, uh, not just from water, but from fertilizer as well. I mean, they're already adapted to the poor quality soils that we have here, especially those local ecotypes here from the Ozarks where our soils tend to be a little lower pHs than other areas. Uh, we have these really old ultasols that are, you know, pretty rocky and, um, you know, not great. Uh, and the problem I made when I first started growing native plants, I lived in an apartment when I first started and I uh, was growing in containers. Uh, and so I went to the store and just bought some miracle Grow, you know, soil, really dark, rich in nutrients, uh, put my plants in there and they, you know, they did great, but they were, you know, growing way too tall and fell over, which is what we call lodging. Uh, and so that, and that really, you know, it's like putting them on steroids. So what I had to learn is to kind of mix in a lot of the poor quality soil. Uh, now that I live in a house out in the country, I could just take some soil from our garden area. Um, and um, when we till, I'm gonna mix it into pots, uh, you know, and they, they do a lot better because it's more of what they're used to. But, you know, since they're already uh, from this area, they're already adapted to a lot of the local native pests that we have here as well, uh, not adapted to the non-native pests. So think about emerald ash borer moths, you know, dev, you know decimating uh, green ash populations. I mean, think about the American chestnut and the Ozark chinkapin getting decimated. Uh, so, I mean, when it comes to the non-native pests, they really don't have a whole lot of defense against those. Uh, but the native pests, the ones that are typically the bane and the side of a lot of uh, gardeners and landscapers, um, you know, they already have their adaptations to, to those pests. So, but one thing to consider is when we use native species, since they are also food for uh, local um, organisms, we do want to allow them to uh, eat it to a certain extent. Um, if you have a milkweed, you know, you might have a monarch caterpillar on there and that thing might eat your milkweed plant all the way down to the ground, uh, but that's okay, that's what you want, right? If, you, if you're planting to help sustain those populations. So what are some applications for native plants and phytotechnology? And I really should have changed that to phytoremediation. I gave the same talk, a modified version where I had a little broader talk about uh, ways of, excess nutrients and uh, help contain soil erosion and whatnot. But, so forgive me for, if you see phytotechnology used throughout this presentation, I should have updated that. But, all right, so design techniques. Uh, here's a picture of a uh, parking lot over there at the University of Arkansas, uh, down the south part near Razorback Road. Uh, and this is just a uh, little bio filter there. I mean, the stormwater runoff comes off of that parking lot. Uh, goes into that area, and then you have some horsetail, uh, equisetum, high mealy probably, uh, and then some trees there that are helping pull up some of those, um, some of the water that's in that stormwater runoff. Uh, so there's ways that we can incorporate some of these species into the way we design the built environment, whether it be stormwater filters, rain gardens, bioswales, detention ponds, uh, interception headrows, uh, riparian buffers along streams, uh, urban forestry, and I'll go into a little bit about air quality here at the end, uh, and commercial landscaping. So we can help sus sustain or support uh, not just uh, bird and insect populations, but also help improve the environment as well. So the contaminants I'm really going to focus on in this presentation are going to be petroleum products, pesticides, chlorinated solvents, heavy metals, polychlorinated biphenyls, and outdoor air pollution. So start off with petroleum products. What are the techniques that we use to degrade these? Well, it depends on the category of petroleum. There's gonna be some that are gonna be easy to degrade, some that are gonna be pretty hard to degrade. Uh, the categories that are pretty easy to degrade are gonna be gasoline, uh, diesel fuel, methyl terbutyl ether, uh, the BTEX, uh, the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, uh, and other aliphatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and a lot of times with some of these, uh, they're also going to evaporate uh, depending on, you know, how long they've been uh, exposed to the app. Uh, they're not as, as huge of a concern as the harder to, to degrade um, categories of petroleum. But for the ones that are easier to degrade, we have a wider range of options of what we can use uh, to help uh, remove these or transform these contaminants. Uh, we, have we can use phytostimulation, phytohydraulics, phytovolatilization, and phytodegradation, whereas 
with the harder to degrade ones, phytostimulation, based on the research that I've seen, is really the only effective uh, way to, to work with these. These are going to be your polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, coal tar, crude oil, heating oil. Uh, and was, we have less options available to us. So what are some sources of petroleum in the environment? Well, we have your, you know, people normally would think of like a fuel spill, a fuel leak, uh, something like that. Uh, but think about just cars, especially older cars. I mean, they, they're dripping things all the time. You go to a park and uh, whenever that business isn't open, say, and you see all the stains and little spots. Um, I mean, you have, especially in parking lots like Walmart, where you have all kinds of cars going in and out all day. Uh, leaking underground storage tanks. You'll be surprised how many gas stations that have been around for longer than 20, 30 years, uh, their underground storage tanks start to leak. Uh, they're required to monitor those. ADQ kind of keeps track of those, and when they start to discover uh, water or something else in there, then uh, they report that, and you know, ADQ goes out, and they have to, you know, somebody has to go and see, you know, what's the extent of how far that leakage has gotten. Uh, but I mean, those underground storage tanks, uh, whoever decided to uh, design them, so, you know, really only put like a 30 liter life on most of them. So I mean, when I go out and do environmental site assessments, I uh, find out that especially if there's a gas station next to a property, if it's been around for more than 30 years, then there's a good chance that that has had what we call a lust or a leaking underground storage tank uh, sometime in recent history. And so sometimes that contamination spreads uh, through the soil and through the groundwater. Uh, automotive repair shops and petroleum extraction activities. Uh, one of the things I do is I work with oil and gas pipelines and well pads out in uh, Louisiana and Texas. Um, and I have some pictures I don't think I'm putting in this presentation, but I mean, those, even those uh, pumps will uh, start leaking. And there'll be like a whole area of no vegetation around it. All right, so what are some species that we can use for remediating a petroleum product. Uh, big blue stem, it's really effective with phytostimulation, so that means we could use it for you know, easy and hard categories. Uh, the polycyclic hydrocarbon, aromatic hydrocarbons, and this is one of our native warm season grasses and one of what uh, are referred to as the big four, which also includes little blue stem. Uh, this also can target the harder categories to degrade, the PAHs which is also one of the big four. And I really want you to drive, drive home the big four. I want you to, if you take away four species from this talk, I want you to remember the big four. We're gonna have big blue stem, little blue stem. This one's able to uh, work with easy and hard categories of petroleum. Um, anthracene, pyrene, uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons and PAHs. And then Indian grass the fourth one of the big four. And these are all uh, four warm season, uh, tall grass prairie grasses, maybe little blue stem might be adapted to short grass prairie, it is a little bit shorter. Uh, but Indian grass, these all, because they're prairie uh, in grasses, they all have these very fibrous root systems as well. So um, recall that I mentioned that these fibrous root systems have a higher surface area, uh, so therefore, a greater volume of the soil underneath it is taken up by that root zone. So more microbial activity is being stimulated per volume of soil. And so this is really helping to break down some of the contaminants, especially in hydrocarbons that might be contained in stormwater runoff. Blue gramma. Side oats gramma. prairie cord grass, eastern gamma grass. I uh, have harvested plenty of Dr. Wolf's eastern gamma grass. Uh, there in the back when I worked for Watershed Conservation Resource Center, we would go out to the farm and harvest your eastern gamma grass plot that I think you had previously done research with uh, to use along the stream restoration projects. So, man, those things are hard to get out of the ground, I'll tell you. <laughs> Bottle brush grass. If anybody has a baby or has had a baby, you can probably tell why this is called bottle brush grass. Those seed heads look just like a bottle brush. And this, uh, one of our wild rye, it's a cool season grass, so this usually goes to seed uh, late spring, early summer. Another wild rye, Canada wild rye. 
Juncus effusus, or common rush. This is a really common Juncus species that you see uh, in low or wet areas here in northwest Arkansas. Uh, and I, I see it used a lot in native plant landscaping for rain gardens, bioswales, uh, especially, um, I'm trying to think, is it 8th Street Market over in Bentonville? Um, there's a lot of it used over there. Uh, ecological Design Group's another great firm in this area. They use a lot of Juncus effusus. Uh, and it's really great, uh, especially when it's used um, next to parking lots or areas or roadways where vehicles are traveling. Green brush, so scurpus species. Nodding bull rush, another scurpus species. And these are also, you find these out um, Osage Park. If anybody has been out there to the wetland, uh, there's a lot of these wetland species here that are I like to think when I'm out there that they're out there on any water that's flowing into that wetland that's run off from somewhere. They're, they're doing the Lord's work, cleaning it up, which wetlands are great for. I mean, they've done studies uh, where they've tested water as it enters a wetland, and then water as it exits a wetland, and finds the water is typically uh, much, much cleaner uh, when it leaves a wetland than when it comes in. Wetlands provide a lot of different benefits for and our cattails, Typha latifolia. And a lot of the plant slides, I'm just gonna kind of roll through just due to time, but if anybody would like a copy of this presentation, uh, happy to send you a PDF, just send me an email. Uh, you can reach out to me either through Wild Ones or Native Plant Society, ANPS.president at gmail.com. Uh, you can do it there, or Wild Ones Ozark Chapter at gmail.com. Common sunflower, Helianthus annuus. This is uh, not the cultivated sunflower that people typically plant in their gardens. This is a straight species. This is one that that cultivar has uh, been bred from. And Senna, obtusifolia. This is one that's uh, blooming around now. Uh, it blooms late in the season. Some leaves look very similar to black locust, but it's usually shorter than that. Black willow. One of our most common willow species here in the Ozarks. It can work with a range of different hydrocarbons. Willow oak, called willow oak because those leaves look similar to willow leaves, uh, but it is an oak. You can see the acorn there. Black locust, and this one will come up again later too, especially when we're talking about air quality. Eastern redbud family those flowers are edible taste just like sweet peas it blooms before the leaves are on any of the trees in the forest usually april up in this region eastern cottonwood common hackberry And red mulberry, if anybody's ever picked red mulberries off of a tree, you know, I can tell you it stains your fingers purple. So there's no hiding what you've been doing after that. Burr oak, Quercus macrocarpa. This is uh, the one that produces a really large acorn. And eastern red cedar. This is a tree that I don't think gets enough love. Shortleaf pine. This is the main native pine species that we have here in the Ozark. So where can we plant some of these species? Uh, well, locations that receive stormwater from roadsides, parking lots, gas stations, auto body shops. Um, remember I talked about leaking underground storage tanks. So if we have these you know, around some gas stations, that could you know, be potentially beneficial uh, should one of those tanks start to spill. Um, you know, it's not going to get every bit of it, but it's going to help. Uh, railroad corridors, rail yards, uh, and oil and gas refineries. And, you know, the point I really want to make here is when we're planting enough of these on the landscape, uh, cumulatively on a landscape scale, uh, I think we'll, this is where we'll really start to see a benefit then um, focusing on specific areas, phytoremediation projects that they've traditionally been uh, used uh, when there's an area with a lot of contamination, somebody's wanting to clean that up. Uh, but I think if we can start to think about, you know, using these plants, uh, what's the surrounding land use uh, going on or activities that are happening around where we want to plant something, 
um, you know, on a large enough scale, then I think that there, there would be uh, a larger benefit. And my hope is that in time, uh, people in the native plant gardening community will be just as knowledgeable about which species are beneficial uh, for improving uh, and breaking down and transforming certain contaminants or beneficial to be associated with certain land uses as they are with which species are beneficial for certain pollinator species or bird species. So pesticides, okay. This photo I took in, um, this is a couple of years ago in Rogers. That's a utility corridor. Usually August seems like a lot of the utility companies around here will go uh, just spray broad, you know, spray just herbicide. Um, you know, and, you know, different herbicides. Um, you know, some of them you know break down pretty quickly, uh, but others aren't so great. So we can use these species I'm about to go over in locations that reach storm, receive storm water uh, from residential areas. Keep in mind, a lot of people spray their yards, they're treating uh, their house for termites, ants, all kinds of things. Uh, rail corridors where the rail company might be spraying herbicide to keep that corridor open, utility corridors, uh, current or historic agricultural fields. Some of the older ones might have used uh, pesticides that are more persistent in the environment, uh, and orchards. So big blue stem has, uh, through research, been shown to have the ability uh, to remediate atrazine, chloropyrifos, chlora, I know I'm going to uh, butcher these names here, so uh, Penda, Methylene, and a lot of these are also used commonly in residential areas, uh, golf courses, that sort of thing. Big blue stem, I want to remind you, is one of those big four. Switchgrass, Atrazine and Pendamethylene, one of those big four. One that Dr. Wolf also did some research on at the University of Arkansas. Indian grass, Atrazine and Pendamethylene. Another big four. Eastern gamma grass. And this is also the species that's thought to be the ancestral species of our modern corn, ZMAs. Uh, there's been different discussions of whether it was uh, bred directly from this species or if it was crossed with another species. I'm not sure uh, what the final verdict on that was, if there is one. But uh, the seeds on this are edible. I wouldn't try to eat them right off the plant. They'll break your teeth, but you can grind them into a, a flower. So, Common rush. That's another one I talked about earlier. Anthracene. Broadleaf cattail. Black willow, river birch, eastern cottonwood again. And one thing they have done with uh, poplar uh, species and willow species is uh, there's some research going on uh, up in New York and Minnesota uh, where they've used these for um, hedgerows, for um, long agricultural fields, and they well breed them or hybridize them with a non-native willow poplar species uh, to make them sterile so that they cannot reproduce. So that you're able to still get the benefits of the phytoremediation without uh, having issues with um, the contaminants entering the trophic chains through pollinators uh, or through uh, or with the risk of them spreading and getting out into the environment. So. They're usually referred to as willow and uh, poplar hybrids. Uh, red mulberry. And common duckweed. This is another one I don't think gets enough love. You know, you see right by a lot of ponds oftentimes, and you see them covered in duckweed. And a lot of times that's indicative that, you know, there's too many nutrients going in that pond. Um, not uncommon to see it in a cow pasture, you know, or somewhere where construction's going on nearby. Uh, but, you know, when you're out in a wetland area, especially the larger kind, uh, eastern Arkansas, and I see this, you know, I just try to recall that this, this is one that is, um, you know, it's a magical speed. I mean, look at everything that it's able to uh, break down through various um, processes that I've listed here. There's somebody, uh, I can't remember which university is, it is up in uh, Missouri, uh, has even studied its ability to uh, uh, phytoremediate glyphosate. So, so you know, I don't know that this is one that you would want to just put in your pond uh, or grow, you know, in an aquatic area. Um, it does shade out, uh, prevent sunlight from entering the water column. You know, it can be uh, bad for water quality 
Uh, but when you do see it, I just want to bring awareness to uh, the things that it is, um, you know, beneficial for. Uh, we'll see later, it's also good for sucking up large amounts of heavy metals. Again, you want to harvest it after that, but there's potentially um, uh, uses here when it comes to uh, maybe certain industrial applications or um, whatnot. Uh, chlorinated solvents, well, what are these? These are uh, often used in cleaners, degreasers, solvents, uh, rocket propellants, uh, fire retardants, and refrigerants. So. Uh, they're commonly used uh, with dry cleaning. Uh, I did a phase one environmental site assessment on a dry cleaner um, in this area, I won't name it, uh, had been out in operation for decades since you know, the 70s or 60s or I can't recall how long. Uh, and they were keeping their uh, TCE and PCE or tetrachloroethylene, which is a chlorinated solvent that's commonly used in the dry cleaning process in a containment uh, behind the store, but with no secondary containment system. And so every time there was a storm, it would fill up that tank and it would overflow. Uh, and there was so much soil contamination in the parking lot area around the store as it had migrated, uh, that that had to be really cleaned up. So especially dry cleaners that have been in operation for a long time, uh, it's not uncommon to find this sort of contamination around them. So. Uh, again, with industrial sites where they're using these uh, chlorinated solvents, rail maintenance yards, yards are never a place where chlorinated solvents are using, are being used, uh, you know, degreasers on those rail cars, uh, cleaning them up, auto body shops, and defense sites, you know, I mentioned um, um, rocket, rocket propellants. So American sweet gum has been shown to have the ability to phytoremediate trichloroethylene, TCE, Cottonwood, PCE and TCE, that's perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene, along with several others I'm not going to attempt to pronounce because I know that I'll butcher those. Eastern redbud, silver maple, American sycamore, river birch. I mean, some of these would be great species to have in parking lots around dry cleaners, I think. Pin oak. Black willow. Blue stem goldenrod. Elm leaf goldenrod. Canada goldenrod, one that does not get enough love. I and mean, a lot of people blame their allergies on goldenrod. Goldenrod's starting to bloom right now. Uh, but what, you know, now you can be allergic to goldenrod, but most of the time what you're allergic to is the ragweed, which is also going to bloom right now. So this one gets a bad rap uh, for a lot of people's allergies. Broadleaf cattail. Eastern gamma grass. All right, so let's talk a little bit about heavy metals. No, 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 not that kind of heavy metal. Yeah, there we go, that kind of heavy metal. All right, uh, first time I've tested that joke out in front of a live audience, so I'm glad to hear a few giggles out there. <laughs> All right, so the, the specifically, I'm just gonna cover, cover chromium, nickel, copper, zinc, finally lead. Um, but keep in mind that there's been research done on um, other heavy metals besides these as well. And these are inorganic contaminants, you know, they're elements on the periodic table. You can't break these down. So really what we're going to be doing here to get these out of uh, the soil typically is going to be phyto extraction. And just a reminder, you use hyperaccumulator species or accumulator species that produce high biomass. Uh, and another thing to consider too is uh, woody species. Um, and I'll t talk about a few here that can use some of these and basically sequester them into their woody biomass. So chromium, sources of chromium in the environment come from dyes, paints, leather tanning, automotive industries, uh, pressure treated lumber. So pale smartweed, Persicaria lepathifolia is a hyperaccumulator of chromium. And Dr. Wolf, if I recall, I think you, I actually met you before we talked about uh, smartweed species uh, out of the farm. Um, I think that was you. 
think I'd let you know that they're edible. Uh, they're very tasty. Uh, some of them have like a hot spicy flavor. Uh, but um, one thing to consider too is, you know, I'm going to talk about other species that are wild edibles. And one thing I didn't consider when I was learning about foraging until I really started learning about phytoremediation is that, you know, some of these you got to be careful with. Uh, especially, you know, species that are accumulating lead. You know, if you collect certain species from roadsides that have had been around since they had lead gasoline, you might be getting a little dose of lead. Uh, duckweed, it's accumulator of chromium. American water lily. Canada horseweed, not a very showy species or one you'd really want to consider using in your native plant garden, but uh, useful nonetheless, especially when it comes to uh, heavy metals. This is one of the, the rock stars for the heavy metal group. Nickel, sources of nickel in our, in our environment include burning of fossil fuels, battery production, windblown dust from industrial areas. And this is one area where they've had uh, a lot of success uh, with uh, of nickel, uh, although through non-native species, so especially with the brassicas. But hairy goldenrod, one of our native species that has been shown to be a hyperaccumulator of nickel. As far, also Pachera uh, paupercula, one of the groundsels. Black locust, Rubinia pseudoacacia. Sunflowers, an accumulator of nickel. You know, and it, you know, it gets pretty big if you have enough of this and it's planted pretty densely. This might be uh, one to test out with research. I don't know uh, the processes for reclaiming that nickel after they harvest the material, uh, but you know, I wonder would be some of these could be uh, used in local research on phyto mining. There's that uh, horseweed again. Dog fennel. And then black willow. This is a woody species. It's a tree. So I mean it's really going to sequester some of those. Um, you know you wouldn't have to necessarily harvest it you know, like you would the herbaceous species uh, unless um, you know the leaves would fall each year. But so that would be something to consider. Copper, sources of copper in our environment, pipe production, electronics, pesticides, and smelting operations. And there's that smell part, uh, pale smartweed, again, Persicaria lepathifolia, hyperaccumulator of copper. One of those big four species, little blue stem, an accumulator. Big blue stem. Side oats gramma. Sunflower. You know, they did some research a while back, I believe in the 70s, using sunflowers for certain groundwater or soil contaminants, and they added um, was it a, something, some sort of amendment uh, to help make the, I can't remember which um, contaminant it was, uh, and they tested the soil later and found out that, yeah, it was, you know, gone, you know, or, you know, low levels, okay, this must have worked, and then um, ended up discovering later that, no, it ended up becoming mobile and getting into the groundwater and uh, leaving the site, so it was the exact opposite of what they wanted to do. Here's Carex vulpinoida, fox sedge, American water lily, pondweed, common duckweed, and false indigo bush, this is a great one for pollinators, uh, Amorpha fruticosa, beautiful species, likes wet feet, moist soil, inundation, uh, accumulator, copper. Black willow. And zinc, we have a lot of historic zinc mines here in the Ozarks, southwest Missouri. So sources of zinc in our environment are smelting operations, mining activities, steel production, galvanization, metal roofing and paneling and tire debris. When you think about when you're, you have a high vo uh, traffic volume roadway like an interstate, how much tire debris and dust comes off of those tires that gets deposited in the roadside. So can't think about that if any of, I, any of you are foraging uh, from roadsides. You know, little bits of tire get shaved off as you drive over time and you have enough cars going through an area, you get you know, a decent amount of tire debris. Uh, side oats grandma is an accumulator of zinc. Here's that horsewood, that rock star in the heavy metal group. Sunflower. 
eastern gamma grass, black willow, All right, cadmium. Sources of cadmium in the environment include fertilizer, sewage sludge, nickel cadmium batteries, uh, pigment production, stabilizers and plastics, metal plating, and smelting operations. Uh, switchgrass is a hyperaccumulator of cadmium. Sunflower is an accumulator. You know, a lot of these nutrients uh, and sources of uh, for some of these plants. Jerusalem artichoke. This is one that people forage the roots in the late fall and winter. Common yarrow. This is a medicinal uh, native plant species. Dog fennel. It's that horseweed again. Rattlebush, Sesbania germundi. Fox sedge, Carex vopinoida. Deciduous holly. American holly. Looks like I need to large, enlarge that text there. Black willow. Sandbar willow. It's another native species, not quite as common as our black willow. And then lead. What are some common sources of lead in the environment? Well, uh, before 1996, leaded gasoline, before 78, lead-based paints, and before 86, lead pipes and plumbing fixtures. Uh, current uses include industrial facilities and batteries and in ammunition. Switchgrass is a hyperaccumulator of lead. Pale smartweed, it's an edible. Foragers forage on smartweed, it's something to consider. Annual ragweed, this is one that does not get enough love. It likes disturbed areas. You know, it's, it would be great for, uh, I mean, the, the seeds are so small. I mean, it does, it's a pioneer uh, early secessional species. Um, and, you know, I understand people who have uh, ragweed allergies wouldn't like this, I don't blame you. Uh, but this is one that is a hyper accumulator of lead and does have its place in nature. Um, a lot of ragweed species uh, do provide some food for certain bird species. Uh, broadleaf cattail, hyperaccumulator of lead. Keep that in mind before you harvest cattail roots. What might be draining into the water where you're harvesting those cattail roots? Side oats grandma, fox sedge, false indigo bush, also known as lead plant, and polychlorinated biphenyls. Now these um, are very mobile hard to degrade uh, molecules. Uh, there are some methods that can be used uh, for these molecules. They were banned in 1979 under the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, they do once in the environment and can travel long distances. Uh, they were previously used in transformers and capacitors. They um, have a low heat transfer. Uh, they can be used in lubricants with low heat transfer, so we're used a lot in electronics. Uh, one of the things I have to look for uh, when I do environmental site assessment on a property um, is old transformers that might uh, not have been replaced in older parts of town that may potentially still contain a PCB and you know look for distressed or dead vegetation underneath them. Most of them have been taken out of commission, but that's not to say there aren't still some out there. Uh, also used in fluorescent light, or you know, have have been used in fluorescent light ballasts, uh, adhesives and tapes, uh, hydraulic systems, motors, thermal insulation, uh, plasticizers and paints, caulking, waterproofing compounds, pesticide extenders. They were used for all kinds of things. Uh, modern sources of uh, polychlorinated biphenyls include pigments. They are still used in inks for paper and plastic products. So some plants that uh, the research uh, has shown have the ability to remediate these include big blue stem, eastern gamma grass, Canada goldenrod, stinging nettle. Never thought there'd be a good use for stinging nettle, huh? Sandbar willow, Osage orange, silver maple, River birch, red mulberry. All right, and the last category is outdoor air pollution. Um, looks like I have a few minutes, but I think I could probably get through this. We might go a little over seven. I hope that's okay. 
First of all, particulates. Well, uh, particulates are going to be these ultra-fine particles in the atmosphere that are going to be airborne, suspended. Uh, they can come through industrial activities, automobile emissions, oil and gas refineries, and coal-burning power plants. Uh, they can also carry heavy metals and other contaminants. They've done research on traffic cops in New York City uh, being exposed to lead just from all the automobile exhaust when they had uh, leaded gasoline. Uh, but well, we can choose species, uh, help reduce the amount of particulates in the atmosphere through a process called phytoaccumulation. Uh, they will often settle onto some leaf surfaces or leaf surfaces and sometimes will be absorbed into the plant or there's uh, research being conducted into the uh, microorganisms on the leaf surfaces, the ability of uh, those to take certain um, atmospheric contaminants and remediate those as well. But uh, conifers are able to uh, do a much better job than broadleaf species in collecting the ultra-fine particles, or what we call PM 2.5, that's anything uh, two and a half microns or smaller, uh, and these, which is really important because the smaller par particulates will get lodged deeper into your lung tissue and are much harder to expel, so they're much worse for, um, you know, respiratory health, uh, but it's not to say that the larger particulates aren't still bad. Uh, but uh, the non-conifers or non-needle-like species, when we're looking at deciduous or broadleaf trees, if we choose uh, trees, uh, species that have waxy leaf coatings, leaf hairs, and a greater leaf area index, these have also been shown to be uh, effective at, um, you know, capturing some of these uh, particles. You know, I think if we, you know, use a lot of the, or are intentional with what species we planted along high traffic roadways, uh, interstates, especially through urban areas like down Little Rock or along I-540, or I'm sorry, I-49, um, you know, that might uh, help contain some of those particulates that are coming off of those roadways uh, before they, they get too far or into the residential areas um, uh, nearby. So shortleaf pine is one of our native needle, uh, needle-leaved species. Common nine bark one of our waxy leaf species, northern red oak, post oak, cherry bark oak, American holly, southern magnolia, not so much as native up here as it is in southern part of Arkansas, but uh, it's still planted around here and isn't too far outside of its range. Rusty black haw, black cherry, like I said, planting roadways or interstates that have high traffic volumes, um, you know, could potentially uh, be beneficial or in, in or near uh, industrial districts, near oil refineries, coal burning power plants. Uh, eventually, those particulates do fall off of those leaves or when those leaves fall or twigs fall, uh, they will eventually be redeposited onto the soil underneath it. So it, it doesn't uh, remove it from the atmosphere if there are, say, contaminants attached to those particulates. Um, but it at least reduces the amount that could be airborne in an area. So it um, doesn't necessarily transform it or degrade it or remove it, but you can combine uh, these capture methods with other methods um, in and around or underneath these species that might help uh, degrade some of these contaminants. Nitrogen dioxide. Now this is a... Um, you know, a gas that's in the atmosphere has different sources from burning fossil fuels, automobile emissions, and from power plants. Uh, there was a study done where they looked at 70 different species uh, to see which, one, which plant species had high assimilation of NO2 um, and high resistance to damage uh, to their tissue from NO2, because uh, this is a gas that uh, does, uh, can damage tissue. Uh, but uh, they found four that uh, had met both of those criteria, uh, high assimilation of NO2 into its biomass and high resistance uh, to tissue damage from NO2. Uh, of those four, one is native to North America, and that's the black locust, Robinia pseudocacia. So, uh, you know, if we saw more of these planted uh, in and around, you know, airports or roadways, then that might be another beneficial use of these. Now, I do want to point out or make the point that uh, when it comes to air quality, uh, you know, they don't think, uh, the people that study this, that um, 
there's going to be a significant improvement in the air quality index from using these species uh, to improve air quality. But there are other, I mean, it's just more of a, you know, as we start to use, um, I mean, the particulate matter is one thing, but when it comes to remediating uh, certain uh, contaminants um, or like uh, the volatile organic, organic compounds, uh, which are often um, uh, combined uh, or trans help, like, sorry, the volatile organic compounds combine with other elements like those NOx gases uh, and can help uh, form O3 or ozone. Um, so I'm trying to remember the research that I just read just the other day. When it comes to these volatile organic compounds, I don't think they expect a huge uh, significant impact on the air quality uh, from um, using trees that emit less volatile organic compounds. Sorry. So, but if we select tree species, uh, since a lot of tree species, they do, well, let me back up. Uh, the world's vegetation, uh, I think, is estimated to contribute to about three quarter of the VOCs in the atmosphere. Uh, that is just through taking things up, um, these VOC, these compounds in the, that may be in the soil or groundwater, and they are released through the leaves. Uh, but if we in urban areas choose species uh, that emit less VOCs, uh, and use these in industrial areas, urban areas, for street trees, um, then you know, we, it's better than using trees that emit high amounts of VOCs. Um, but the amount that would be reduced is not going to uh, do a whole lot to uh, counteract the amount of VOCs that are entering the atmosphere or the environment through various sources. But uh, through there has been some research shown that uh, several different species, um, it was a list of, I can't remember how many, but they were focusing on New York City. Uh, New York City street trees, and so I pulled from that, and they looked at which tree species were emitting less uh, VOCs, and I pulled from that list a list of species that were native to here in the Ozarks. So and from that, we have Eastern Red Cedar, Downy Serviceberry, Basswood. I used to always say basswood, but somebody recently told me it's called Basswood. Uh, also, American Linden, Winged Elm, American Elm. Flippery elm, one of those that uh, can be a little less well behaved. If you want to read a little further into this, this Phyto book, I really highly recommend, especially if you're in a landscape architecture profession or environmental science, or, or you know, it's a really great resource. I mean, it covers native and non-native species. You've got to kind of go through and pick out the native species if you're wanting to stick with natives. But it also is just a great resource for design techniques, low-impact development type design. Uh, another couple of great books that um, I've found useful, uh, especially just for an introduction into uh, phytotechnologies. I mean, it's a little academic uh, reading, uh, but if you're um, into that, then uh, these other two, phytoremediation, transformation and control of contaminants, and phytotechnologies, remediation of environmental contaminants are also great sources. Uh, there's a professional society called the International Phytotechnology Society. It was formed in 2006. Uh, you can join that and get access to their journal, the International Journal of Phytoremediation, which is an excellent source of research. Uh, you can go to their website at phytosociety.org or send them an email at membership at phytosociety.org. Um, and I think I took off the slide, but there's another lady out there that's put together a great database, uh, Stevie Fumilari. I think it's steviefumilari.net. Uh, if you go to her website, uh, she does all kinds of things, uh, but she has a really great database for plants, for phytoremediation, uh, where she links to a, or has cites the uh, academic research article um, that she's uh, used to reference to put in that database, and that's really good too. There's one of the universities in Kansas also has access database file that you can download, uh, which is also a great resource for native or just any plant for phytoremediation um, for certain contaminants. You can look it up by different criteria. Um, you know, if you're wanting to stick with native, then uh, you can cross-reference that with a website like bonap.org uh, to see if it's native in your area or the area you're wanting to plant it. And then again, this is that wild ones group. 
Uh, we've been around here in Northwest Arkansas since 2020. Uh, you can visit us on the web. You can follow us on Facebook. You can uh, send an email to us. We also have a YouTube channel. Uh, we have monthly webinars. So if you want to get signed up on our list uh, to receive announcements for those monthly webinars, uh, just send an email to wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. And uh, all of our webinars are recorded and put onto our YouTube channel. Uh, we started just before uh, the pandemic, so we haven't been able to have in-person meetings, but we are starting to have virtual meetings uh, following our webinars where we'll have open discussions based on the topic of that month's webinar. So anyone who's interested in using native plants for gardening, landscaping, uh, or creating more sustainable living landscapes, uh, this is a great organization to join. We also have a quarterly chapter journal that we publish once a season. Uh, and then we make that free and available to the public, just like our webinars. But if you join the organization, you get access to the national organization's quarterly journal as well. So, and then other benefits that come through, like webinars given by Doug Tallamy, Heather Holm, other people in the native plant community. With that, I'll end it. Any questions? to drink it um, I mean the best thing to do I mean the Arkansas Water Resource Center at the University of Arkansas is able to test water if you send in samples uh, you know, it costs it does cost you money uh, but you can always test it uh, to see what the levels are um, uh, to see you know if it's uh, being effective but it really uh, depends on what your inputs are or what sort of contaminants might be contained in that so what I might recommend is just getting a water sample, seeing what's in there, and then figuring out from there uh, what you need to, you know, transform or degrade uh, or extract. I mean, extract is going to be, phyto extraction is going to be more labor intensive because you got to, you know, pull those plants out, uh, and replant them. But um, so, I mean, without knowing, you know, what comes out in the water sample, I don't know that I could suggest specific species, but like I mentioned on our website, um, ozark.wildones.org, uh, you can find some of these lists uh, that are put together and cover species that didn't go over here today. So, yes. Could she potentially use the edge of the water where the soil is and get a free soil sample through the extension office? The extension office, yeah, you can do get at least one free soil sample a year. Yeah. Uh, so that's if you want to test the soil uh, to see what's there. Uh, depends on, you know, the system. You know, if you have water coming in somewhere, I mean, I don't know, you know, how your system's set up, but if it's just an isolated, it might be a little different, uh, you know, excluding runoff that might still be coming from the environment. But yeah, definitely you can get, um, that goes for gardeners. Uh, you typically, the soil test is only going to tell you like nutrients and, a, you know, a few things. It's not going to really go into like contaminants. Uh, so for like looking at contaminants in soil, you need to um, reach out to like a private like environmental testing lab and they are there are those in the area uh, that's who we rely on uh, when we need to figure out you know how far contamination has spread uh, if you just google environmental testing lab uh, you know just on one just get on the website uh, some of them do everything from like asbestos testing to lead-based paint testing you want to find one that does soil uh, you know soil testing so have you come across any um, governmental agencies at any level, municipal, up to state or national, that have suggested, you know, mandating planting certain plants outside of a gas station? Or, I mean, you know, it seems like this is a no-brainer, right? Like, I mean, if you if you're going to have that, then five percent of your lot coverage should be uh, it should all be rated this way, and you have this just as a we're going to start doing it before the problem happens. But I mean, like. You know, I mean, what about, or similarly, I know in Tucson, uh, not Tucson, somewhere, I can't remember. I think Tucson, Arizona, you know, there's a guy who totally has re reshaped how they do stormwater by basically creating biosoils off mm -hmm. the edges everywhere. I mean, 
we have such a bad stormwater problem here. You know, do you see in, in governmental agencies that you come in contact with any burgeoning openness to that kind of, oh, instead of planting a lawn that we're going to have to fertilize and mow and irrigate, why don't we make it a swale with these plants that are going to start to take out and clean our water and reduce stormwater with, you know, I mean, it's going to start to do lots of beneficial things. I mean, I assume you have some interaction with the agencies. And yeah, I mean, I have not, I'm not aware of any agencies that require it or local municipalities or governments that require it. Um, you know, there are, you know, some company, you know, municipalities in this region most of them have you know tree preservation ordinances when it comes to leaving and replanting you know trees depending on how much is cleared for new construction uh, there are municipalities in this region that are open to that idea of having um, in, uh, also private developers in this area that are open to the idea of having bioswales and rain gardens and low impact development type um, um, design techniques used um, we just finished designing uh, one for the new Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield building that's, uh, they're wrapping up construction over there near, uh, on I-49 near the Don Tyson exit. Uh, but yeah, that'll have a series of uh, water detention ponds uh, with species that are gonna help improve some of that water quality uh, before it finally leaves the site. Um, Ecological Design Group is another firm in this region that does a lot, uh, they do a lot of projects that are uh, Walton Family Foundation funded. So that's one thing that the Walton Family Foundation is uh, putting their money towards. Uh, the city of Rogers is using a lot of native plants and the roundabouts. Um, you know, if you go out to Lake Atalanta, I mean, that's all native plant landscaping out there. It's like one giant rain garden. Uh, the city of Conway is uh, looking at doing a re stream restoration uh, on some of their areas. They're open to that. Um, they also um, some municipalities will uh, fund a, what they call a rain garden demonstration project. So it's meant to be educational, help stimulate those ideas. Like the Craft and Toll, we did some rain gardens down in downtown Little Rock several years ago as well. Uh, so I mean, it, it seems to be, you know, the municipalities, depending on, you know, funding and, you know, whether they can afford it, um, you know, hire a design firm that can do that uh, because you want to make sure that it's designed to handle, you know, certain stormwater flows. Um, so they typically want an engineer that, you know, puts their stamp on it. Um, I mean, there are those municipalities that are open to that. Uh, and then there are certain businesses that are open to that. Um, and I, I really see here in Northwest Arkansas a lot more of the use of these uh, techniques. But no, I'm not aware of anywhere where it's uh, required by law or anything. So, but, you know, I think you'd probably get resistance from some of the interest groups that represent developers, you know. Well, I mean, you know, you talk about the cost, sorry, I don't, we can talk about it later, but, no, sure. uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's like the upfront cost would be marginally higher by probably 5% or less. The long-term cost would be significantly less, and also there's myriad more benefits to operators, sure. to the people who walk this path, to, you know, yeah. to the stormwater engineers, you think they'd be all on board, but it's all, you know, Right now. Part of it too is yeah education. You know, for some engineers, you know, taking a channel and making a concrete channel to get the water off site as quickly as possible, you know, is the goal. You know, even though that might cause higher flows downstream, greater erosion downstream, you know, there you know some developers are more concerned about on site stuff. They're not as concerned about what happens off site. You know, the the those uh, expenses are pretty much passed downstream a lot of times. Um, you know, municipalities that, you know, are treating or, you know, storm or what we call our wastewater uh, treatment groups like Beaver Water District, you know, they absorb a lot of those costs. Um, and so it's, it's, it's difficult uh, when, you know, the person that is making those decisions or doing that type of development, you know, isn't the one that's uh, taking on the extra costs. And so I think that's kind of where some of that barrier is, but that's also where education hopefully um, will help in time. That's my hope, you know. And there are a lot of developers, especially in this region, that are getting on board. Uh, the Urban Land Institute, I believe it is, uh, has a lot, um, you know, as a group, has a lot of the developers involved in that group are um, more progressive and open-minded. Uh, specialized realty group, you know, they do a lot more. Uh, they have like Eco Modern Flats uh, apartment complex in Fayetteville, uses a lot of natives.
No. Any other questions? Just have you worked with um, hyperaccumulators and then removal of hyperaccumulators? Is it something where you can just cut off the tops of the plants, dispose of them, and let them grow again, continue that process? Uh, I have not personally worked with that. I've just like to geek out and read about it. Uh, and I would think it would depend on what part of that plant is accumulating because sometimes it's the roots that are accumulating the most. Uh, so, um, but I, th I think that's the idea of some of the perennials uh, and then having some woody species like poplars uh, and willows that are able to sequester some of those into their mass uh, where you don't have to go back and harvest uh, is another option there. Um, and then, you know, annual species are going to produce a lot more seeds because they're annuals, they only live a year, so their strategy to make sure there's more of them next year is to produce a ton of seeds. Um, and they tend to have shallower roots. Uh, they're not going to be getting uh, down into the soil as deep uh, each year as they grow. So, um, you know, so a lot of the species that are going to be used are going to have to be perennial species. Um, so, um, I mean, Dr. Wolf might be able to answer that question. I think you've University of Arkansas. The studies that I'm aware of, Angle and Cheney did a zinc uh, hyperaccumulator back in Pennsylvania where the site was a smelter area that had been contaminated. And I can't remember for sure what the plant was. It may have been fescue, but it was a good accumulator. It was a modified one. And they were able to harvest the top and they just bailed it and hauled it off. And, uh, you know, the, the economics of burning it and reclaiming the metals or burying that, going to a class five landfill, I don't know about that. Okay. But they weren't using the concept you're talking about of being able to harvest it and come back next year and grow again. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the species that they've traditionally used have been those non-natives like tall fescue. Um, so, um, and like, you know, and the benefit there, as long as you can contain it and keep it from getting out in the environment, because tall fescue can be pretty noxious uh, and take over and outcompete a lot of our native species. Uh, but, you know, the benefit there too, um, you know, some of those non-native species are gonna be uh, better at not allowing some of those contaminants from getting into the trophic chain. But that's not to say that there aren't still species that are gonna eat tall fescue. So, I mean, I mean, it's really, um, what was I gonna say? You know, the, and, you know, economics has changed too, I think since the seventies. So, I mean, you know, it's, that's really a lot of the ultimate driver of a lot of things is, you know, what's gonna be the most cost effective approach. And uh, phytoremediation is definitely cheaper than the other traditional methods of dealing with contaminants, but it takes longer. Uh, it's a slower process. So that's really the advantage there, um, cheaper, but slower. You know, and that's when we're talking about like, you know, your traditional phytoremediation projects where you have contaminated like a brownfield, you know, side or something, turn it into a green field. Was there a question there? Yeah. Um, so on the uh, heavy metal phyto extraction, you named uh, Jerusalem artichoke and the yarrow. Mm -hmm. um, those are also edible plants. So is that kind of an either or decision? You are either going to use it for heavy metal remediation mm -hmm. or you're going to eat it? Or is it safe to be both? Uh, I would consider what uh, the surrounding land uses are in the area where you might use it for, uh, you know, to edible or medicinal value. Um, and um, in Jerusalem artichoke, it's those roots uh, that are typically eaten. I mean, I would just look at, you know, if you're out, you know, on your own property and you're, you know, out in the country, you know, you're, you're probably safer than if you're in an industrial area or in the middle of an urban area. Same with, you know, yarrow. Um, so, I mean, the point I really try to drive home with foragers is to really uh, think about where you're collecting from. Are you underneath some power lines? Are you, um, you know, near a rail corridor? Or what's, are you collecting from a, a pond that might be receiving storm water or water from, you know, that, from an industrial area upstream, you know? Are you collecting from a roadside that's been around for 50 years? You know, um, so, I mean, it it's really depends on the location. Best answer I can. Yeah. Is there another question? I was just wondering about you know, like in mulberries and stuff. Like, I wondered if the like does it go in the berries or is it? That's a good question. Or? You know, I'd have to go back and look at the the research article because it goes to different parts of different yeah. plants too, um, and so that's you know really 
actually just a crash course, you know, if you really want to get into it, you know, I mean, I have these articles, I have a, you know, collection of them home on a hard drive, um, uh, happy to share, you know, the research I've come across and, you know, point you in the direction of some sources or even to try to find that out for you. Uh, but yeah, certain uh, contaminants are going to go to certain places, you know, some of them go into leaves, some of them stay predominantly in the roots, some up into the shoots, and then, you know, sometimes they can make it into pollen. Um, I don't know about fruits, but, um, you know, and then, you know, at certain levels, some of these are also nutrients for us. It's just whenever, you know, uh, you know, it might be spread out enough in the plant that I don't know what amount might be in a particular part of the plant that you might be using. You know, that's, um, that's. I've never heard of that. Right. I mean, I've seen research done on uh, honey beehives, uh, bringing back heavy metals that they get from pollen from, uh, you know, the plants uh, that uh, have like high loads of heavy, heavy metal in their pollen. Uh, but, you know, honey production is something where people are willing to fund research because that's, you know, a food crop. Um, you know, a lot of it's about, you know, who, who's going to fund the research to find out. You know, uh, and mulberries, I don't know if they're really a, a food crop, you know. Um, you're right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that I would love to see research. And maybe there is research I haven't come across, too. And that's, that's just a good thought. Uh, I haven't heard of uh, huge like wildlife kills from something like that. Uh, but things like lead, you know, especially when it comes to cattail roots, which are commonly forage, you know, lead's, you know, neurotoxin. And if people are, they're not our great grandparents' cattail roots uh, as a point you know I like to bring up is you know depending on where you're collecting them from so any other questions all right well thank you all very much for being here and um, again um, feel free to reach out uh, if you have anything later I'm happy to send you a copy of the slides as well so, thank you